All right. <clears throat> Welcome to the June 9th, 2020 Club Cubase Google Hangout. We'll get started here in just a couple minutes. I will just uh, refresh my browser here and we'll make sure that audio is going through and we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. If you could bear with us, we're going to allow people to get logged in. And I will go ahead and just do a quick. All right, so it sounds like audio is coming through fine. So um, if you haven't attended a Club Cubase Google Hangout, how it works is we uh, this will be kind of an interactive Q&A. It's really the topics depend upon what whatever questions people ask in the Hangout. You can submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de or you could uh, enter them into the comments field. Um, so this is a live broadcast. If you're watching this uh, after the live broadcast, you may wanna skip ahead to eight to 10 minutes. Uh, and we're, as we have to get people get logged in, we'll do some introductions. So if you want to go ahead and if you're watching this after the fact, you can skip ahead. We'll try to have the Hangout indexed uh, later tonight with all the questions that were asked. Uh, so if you want to introduce yourself into the comments field, uh, we could do that. You could also ask questions in the comments field. If you're asking questions, we'll try to do them as chronologically as possible. So we will... Um, so if you have a question, entering it in uh, multiple times in the comments field isn't going to help get the question answered any quicker. So if we could try to refrain from doing that, it would be appreciated. It just makes going through all the different uh, questions easier. Uh, and I don't have to reread the same question multiple times. It's That's great. So um, like many of you, I have uh, my family at home, so we may be interrupted. My wife will be working directly above me, and my son is here, so he at home, so he may interrupt uh, me to get a new movie on or to do get an activity for him to set up uh, while we're doing a hangout. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, so we will get some people logged in and we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. Okay, so let's see where people are from here. So, okay, so we have Jim from Pennsylvania, Vinny from Orlando, Quebec City, Buffalo, New Jersey, South India, see a question can I get more interactive by going to my Google Hangout um, I'm not sure if that questions for me um, maybe if you could specify again okay so, all right so we have ambient Dave good to see you on the hangout Millard Brown Okay, so we have Taylor from Pine Grove. Good to see you. All right, so we have Norway, Wisconsin. All right, so more people getting logged in. All right, so Jan from Sweden. All right, so we have UK, Hampshire. Seeing people uh, ask if my family's well. We're all doing great, thank you. All right, so we have Sir Robert from Atlanta. Good to have you on a Hangout. Long time Cubase user. Okay, so we have Turkey. Norway, Lynchburg, Virginia. I used to play in the symphony there when I was in college. Did a gig with Emmy Lou Harris there with the symphony. It was a lot of fun. And her bass player was sick, so I got to sit in on electric bass. Okay, 
Okay, so we have Sweden. All right, so we have Seattle, UK, Finland, Germany, Portugal, All right, so we have Boston, okay, so I've seen some questions on control rooms, we have Germany, Vancouver, Sherman Oaks, Northern Germany, Greencastle, Pennsylvania, someone else from Vancouver, San Pedro, Brooklyn, Amsterdam, Okay, just going through uh, Mississippi, London, Senegal, New York City, Okay, so just more people getting logged in. All right, so we have Minnesota, Kenya, Greece. All right, Belgium, South Africa. Chile, Los Angeles, Greenland. Okay, Bulgaria. Okay, SoCal. All right, we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. More people getting logged in. Brazil, Liverpool, South Africa. Czech Republic. Netherlands. Good to see Jazz Dude on a hangout. Brazil. All right, someone else from Netherlands. All right, so seeing some score editor questions. Good to see Robbie from Dallas on the Hangout. All right, maybe another 30 seconds and we'll get started. Okay, so let's go ahead. It's about 10 minutes after the hour, so let's take a look and get started with questions. Okay. Um, so let's just see kind of a question in jest. How can Cubase turn water into wine? It's probably just your investment. Think of it that way. So you 
All right, so let's say uh, when removing an inserted plugin on track, is there an easy way to do? Because I have to go all the way up to the top and select an effect. So, so let's say if I wanted to remove like this insert effect, um, generally what you would have to do, what a lot of people think that they have to do is when you go to click is kind of navigate all the way to the very top. And if you have all your different plug-in windows open here uh, and choose no effects. So there's an easier little trick that you could do is if we just kind of drag the insert effect to somewhere else in the program to like an empty space that will delete it. So again, if I just take this particular insert effect and drag it out of the insert slot, that will get rid of the effect for you as well. So that's a quick way of being able to get rid of inserts. <clears throat> question hey greg uh how do you create an a pre effect send so if i wanted to select these particular tracks or let's say if i wanted to do this to and if i have this track selected you could right click and we could choose to add effects channel to selected channels so let's say if I just wanted to add a delay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so if I just wanted to add a delay to that, what I could do is we'll have that as our effects end. Um, I'll select this particular channel. When we go to sends, all you'd have to do is right click and you could just say move to pre fader. So any of your different effect sends, you could just kind of right click on it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm my voice there. Uh, and just right click and you could choose to move to pre fader or move to post fader. So when you see it kind of this greenish color that indicates that it's pre fader. So that's, that's an easy way to be able to create a pre effect send. And you could do that for, you know, different effect sends on different channels as well. Okay. Okay, so we've got a question from David. Uh, please explain how to do portamento glides using some bass strings. I think I have a project open for this. And I often do this kind of using sampler track. So in here, I just have a, uh, just a bass sample that I just kind of dragged into my sampler track. And then what you could do is, you know, go to the pitch tab here. We can make sure that this is set to monophonic mode. And now as you want it to, you know, do different glides, So if you wanted to hear that kind of maybe in context, let's say with like just a little bit of a bass line here uh, where you want to do glides. So let's say without. So I could just now come over here and put the glide in. And if you want to make that longer, which may not work musically. without glides and now with, with the glides so play around you know just using like the sampler track and it could really be dependent upon the instrument but put it into <clears throat> like a quick monophonic mode here and then under pitch, just kind of set your glide. And 
then you could just kind of do uh, glides pretty easily that way. Okay. Um, question. Uh, how would you go about mixing vocals to a stereo backing mix? Uh, if I have five stereo uh, tracks, but the original stems are impossible to get due to an old broken laptop, you know, I would treat it kind of the the same way as working with any other vocals. So let me just uh, open up an example here. Something with some vo vocals. So if I just wanted to come here. So there's no really big difference that I would do when mixing, you know, obviously if you have the chance to do mixing of all the elements, but you know, if you're happy with what the mix is with your vocals, you know, just kind of come over here, apply the same kind of EQs. So if we have a vocal like this, which doesn't sound bad, you know, but I'm just gonna add a little bit of reverb and, and EQ, just kind of to dial it in. And then maybe just a little bit of compression. So just kind of bypassing. So I just have a little bit of gate. So just some of these processes that I'll just activate here. Bypassing these. Can make a big difference. So just because you maybe are starting off with different sources, as long as your source tracks are mixed fine and you're happy with the overall tone, I think you should be okay kind of treating the vocal the same way. Okay, um, so let's see, can you please give us some EQ tips on how to practice identifying bad EQ resonant hertz or frequencies, for example, using a Cubase EQ plugin. So when you're doing something like this, um, let's say if I have... Um, <clears throat> like you may run into scenarios where you have a piano and a vocal that are clashing with each other. So one of the things that I will, that's really handy is looking at the frequency response. Just turn this down just a little bit. Is looking at the frequency response that's actually indicated on the particular tracks. So you can kind of see where the fundamental, you can kind of see the harmonic overtone series spread across there. So when we kind of look at that now, What's helpful is this EQ comparison mode because sometimes if you're looking for like an annoying frequency, and let's say if you know that this song is in a particular key, so I'm gonna look at the, my chord track here. So we're in the key of C major. So knowing what the key of the song is can make a big difference because now you could actually just come here and say, I want to EQ around C3. Uh, and type the note name in 
And this way you could actually kind of EQ based upon the actual frequency curve uh, or what the pitch is at the key. And that can make a big difference. So when I come here and we we're playing our vocal, if we know that we're kind of in the key of C, what did you say? then I could just say, okay, I want this to be maybe, I want to boost some of the overtone series. Maybe we'll get to C6. C7. Let's do C8. So you can kind of EQ in the frequency. So being aware of what key the song is in is also really helpful. Now in Cubase 10.5, there's this really in interesting concept where we can now have kind of a spectral comparison. So I could take this and say, I wanted to go to uh, my instruments. So let's say I wanted to look at my piano track. Here I can see the frequency response of the piano track behind what's going on with the vocal. So if I wanted to EQ the piano, and then switch So this way you can kind of see the different frequencies of the two parts and switch and EQ those. So that if you have two parts that are if you have two parts that are clashing, you could say, okay, now I want to EQ the vocal, but I could see kind of as a reference to piano track, and now I could EQ those things so that those aren't fighting for the same uh, frequency space. So that's a really helpful tool. So just make sure that you activate this and you have this the spectral comparison EQ. Then you could just kind of solo between the two different bands uh, and EQ appropriately. So, and if you wanted to go to the settings to make it, you know, more distinct uh, colors, you could adjust those as well. But those are some tips that I would do for EQing. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, so a question. I think Gareth asked this a couple times, but uh, could you go through some of the chord editing options and the key editor left pane? So let's take a look. You know, some of the options that you can have here that are useful is, you know, if I wanted to just kind of select a particular chord. You know, one of the options that I really like doing is just kind of adjusting different inversions. You know, like a lot of times you may copy something, like maybe like, let's say like a Rhodes with a strings pad on top of it. And then as you do that, you realize that some of the, uh, you know, like you may want to have just different chord voicings. Um, so here you could, you know, drop notes within a chord, you know, you know, you could come over here and have different triads. So if you wanted to, you know, see your chord type here, you could also, uh, you know, add, you know, this particular element to a chord track. But I find that one of the things that's super helpful is like if you select a particular phrase or a chord here, uh, just the inversions and you could use a keyboard shortcut. Just to get kind of different voicing options. Um, and then if you wanted to, you know, analyze the notes here, you could do that and have that automatically play into the chords, uh, into the chord track. But, you know, play around with, I find that using some of these uh, voicing options here just to have something, a different chord voicing could be really helpful. Uh, especially when kind of copying and layering different chords together so they're not clashing. Okay. <clears throat> Question from Taylor. Uh, what is the difference between 
uh, zero dB on the zero on the stereo out meter and zero true peak on the loudness meter. So let's go ahead and take a look. That I will just kind of revert this quickly back so it doesn't sound horrible. All right, so when we come over here, we could have just our full metering. I'll adjust my control room volume here. So, so you, know, you could have different metering scales here. So this would be kind of our full digital scale. As well as if you want to see like Cat System 20. And with 10.52, there's a couple new metering scales as well. So if you want to see like for a plus 12 dB, a lot of times depending on your meters and calibration of your audio interface, you know, like zero dB may mean minus 18 in other, in actual metering just as kind of a fail safe. But, you know, generally that's kind of the accepted standard. So when we come here, we can notice that we'll have this kind of as we play along but then when we go to loudness meters this will be more of a actual uh you know this is a more contemporary metering standard here so when we look at our loudness meters here this would be more applicable for delivery for broadcast or if you're doing uh for delivering for streaming services so and we could think of this roughly in the old days, you could have peak versus RMS metering. And we could think of loudness units as a very sophisticated uh, RMS or kind of the average uh, level for metering. And this way we could have kind of the volume between different tracks kind of be coming in at a known entity. Okay. Let's just move on. All right. Question, uh, is it possible to get away with some cheap budget speakers around $200? It's already got some decent AKG cans. Apparently, you can't beat car speakers for mixes, so why bother with expensive speakers? You want to make sure that, you know, it's as long as, you know, ideally people, you know, in, in a perfect utopian society scenario, you'd want to have you know something that you knew that you know what they sound like and there's flat in a, in a room um so there's different schools of thought i know some people you know like the reason that yamaha ns10s grew so popular like in the 70s and 80s was because it was a known point a known reference monitor that could be carried from studio to studio um, and the, so engineers could carry them, plug them into an amp and they kind of knew what they were getting and it could take kind of the room out of the scenario. Um, some people used to mix with car speakers way back when, you know, like, especially like, I remember a good friend of mine, Bob Welch telling me once that, you know, when he was doing one album in the seventies, they mixed it in, in a mono car radio for one track. And the next single was mixed in F for FM stereo. So one was going to be played on AM radio and one was going to be played on FM radio. So the one on AM radio was mixed to mono on a, you know, a really inexpensive, probably like an R tone type of speaker. Whereas the next single was mixed, uh, you know, for FM radio. So I, I don't think we have those constraints now. Um, a lot of people will, you know, it, it also is critical how people are listening to music. So, you know, more people listen to it with headphones now than previously, um, you know, listening to it with their, you know, on their phone or, you know, if they still have iPods and stuff like that, they could do that. So making sure that it translates. Um, but ideally you'd want kind of like a really nice, you know, decent set of monitors that didn't hype or accentuate or cut out particular frequencies so that you knew that there was kind of a flat environment. Um, you know, and there's, you know, like many great recording things today, there's a lot of great uh, budget um, 
you know, speakers, you know, check out some of the, you know, if you're on a budget, check out some of the Yamaha HS fives or HS sevens or, you know, the inexpensive JBLs, you know, there's a lot of great inexpensive speakers that are available today. So take advantage of that. Um, but I think, you know, if it sounds good on your AKG headphones, it sounds good on your studio monitors. That's always good. Um, but you know, I know, you know, one of my friends, Elliot Shiner, who's probably like, you know, one of the most highly regarded mixers. He still does everything on NS tens. And he's like, you know, he's like, I don't want speakers that sound good because I want my mix to sound good on bad speakers. And he knows how to work it, but you know, he spent a lifetime doing that. And knows how to make those work. So, you know, but it's whatever you get good results with. You know, it's it may be easier to get good results quicker with speakers. So, okay. Okay, so... Um, I see input monitor while listening to pre-recorded audio when... Um, I think this may be, um, like if you want it to, uh, I think this might be with a recording mode. So if you want it to have the input monitor, um, you know, there's a couple of different preferences that you could set up. So if you go to preferences and go to, uh, VST, Try setting your tape. You'll see different preferences for auto monitoring style. So if this is a kind of a monitoring question for the input monitor while listening to the pre-record it, try setting it to tape machine style. And then I think like as you are, let's say if we wanted to do a punch in on a particular range here. So let's say I just wanted to uh, punch a particular section here. So let me just put my punch in and punch out. And if we have this set to an input that we will hear the existing track until the punch in and then you'll and then as soon as the punch in occurs, then you're gonna hear the recorded signal. So I think if I'm understanding correctly that, you know, try going to your preferences and under VST, set your auto monitoring style to tape machine style. Okay, hi Greg, uh, from Sweden. Can you please demo the step designer a bit, automating switch on and off and automating pattern changes, explaining steps, uh, the amount step size a bit perhaps. All right, let's open up a new project here. Okay, so let's see. I think it's going to show up as a MIDI plugin. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and play a particular note here. So let me just uh, input a chord. I'll record a. Let me get it uh, not on a monophonic patch. Okay, 
there with me, sorry. Okay, so let's see how this affects our step designer. So you have different velocity sensitivity here. So it's Set kind of different rhythmic values here. So it seems to kind of have a particular phrase here. We could take out different rhythmic values. Kind of draw in different sequences if you want it. And then it looks like if you wanted to just as you kind of play that in, if you wanted to just record that, you can then just record that particular pattern directly into the sequencer. So I'll, I'll kind of play around. I haven't played with this in a long, long time, but it looks like you could just kind of draw in different patterns that will play back. You can set the rhythmic interval here. So if you wanted that to be 30 second notes, how many steps you wanted it to be, and there's some different presets here so as you kind of play. And if you don't want it, So that give you an idea of some some of the stuff you can do with this Step Designer plugin.
Okay. Uh, so question, is there an optimal way to export an event as audio without exporting the channel? So there's a couple of different ways. So if you have, you know, let's say if I have this particular sequence here that I've done and I wanted to, you know, and we, if we played this back and we look at this particular event here, we can see that pattern that's being generated. So So let's say I did something silly like that, but that's just some MIDI. Um, you could always just do a render in place. Uh, if you didn't want to do like an export and just choose to go to your render settings, um, you could choose to do dry and then that would render it as a, as a standard audio file that could go directly into your timeline. So check out some of the different render in place options. And I think that that could help you with that. Okay, so we have a question. Hi, Greg. What is control room for? <clears throat> so we can think of the control room as, you know, like a lot of times when you think of a large console, we have kind of the, you know, a lot of channels that are repeated. And you have a control room. And a control room allows you to have, you know, different monitoring volumes. So we go to your audio connections. We could set up your control room, and this is in Cubase Pro. So we'll see our control room and here we could add a, uh, and we use the available inputs and outputs of our audio interface. So we could have a talk back microphone. So if we needed to communicate with people that were recording in the studio that have headphones, um, you know, we could have a, an input of our audio interface that we could connect a talk back microphone. You could have other inputs that will be set up for uh, like maybe the audio from an iPad or a phone, you could have different headphone mixes. So if you're doing, uh, I wanted to come here and have a Q mix for vocals. I could add a vocals Q mix so that we could do headphone mixes for different people. Um, there's also the ability to connect up to four different sets of monitors. So if you have more than one pair of speakers, um, we can now, you know, come over here and switch between different monitors. The basic premise of the control room is that you would have a separate volume that's not tied to the gain structure of the stereo output of your mix console. So a lot of people use this as their monitoring volume and if they have their speakers kind of cranked way up and they have this down, when they go to export their mix down file, it's actually exporting down minus 30 some dB. Uh, not because that's what's good for the file, but that's where they are set with their monitoring volume. So with the control room, we had the big red knob and this is intended to really be the level of the monitoring without affecting the gain structure. So it's kind of decoupled from that. Once we have that set, there's also a dim control. So if you wanted to uh, dim by, you know, a, a specific amount of dB and you could set the dim level here. Um, so you could say now as soon as I'm playing, I could dim or if I wanted a known reference point. So let's say the loudest that I want to mix is here. Um, at that point, you could just go directly to, I'm sorry, this, this is your dim, and this will be your kind of known reference point. So if you click on alter option and click, you could say this is as loud as I'm gonna let the studio monitors, as loud as I'm gonna allow my monitoring to go before I, I realize I'm lying to myself. And if you wanted to switch between different speakers, so if you have like a Yamaha or JBL or Genelec or an Oritone, whatever, you could switch between different speakers here. At this point, you could also go into, uh, if you go to inserts, we could have different uh, plugins that would be going as inserts. But when we go to uh, your monitor levels, we could have different levels for each of the different speakers as well. So that when we do switch between speakers, that we could have kind of a known volume. 
If we were doing headphone mixes for people, we could also come over here and we could enable talk back so that our microphone in the control room could be fed to the independent headphones. Uh, and we could set up independent mixes so that the vocals could hear a more me headphone mix. The guitars could hear more me headphone mix where the guitar is louder, the vocals are louder. And you could also choose to uh, not have the click in various headphones. So if you don't want to edit out the click track that's bleeding through the headphone mic going into the the headphones going into the vocal mic, you could just turn that off, but have the click track going into the drummer, the bass player, and guitar player's headphone mixes. So that's a couple of things what you could do with the control room. Once you kind of get into it, it's it's very powerful and gives you a lot of flexibility. Okay, um, let's see. Question, is there a Cubase 11 on the horizon and when will it surface? Um, you know, generally, you know, what Steinberg does is, you know, when it's uh, when it's announced, it's available. It's generally, you know, I'm sure that there's people working on it as there are people working on, you know, probably 11.5 and 12. So, you know, I think if you look through the history of release dates, you might be able to determine a pattern. So maybe if you just go to Wikipedia and figure it out. But, you know, 10.5 was just released like last October. So that could probably give you a pretty good idea of what's going on. All right. Um, so question, hi, uh, greetings from Amsterdam. Does Cubase have a multiband splitter in their plugin arsenal? I know what a lot of people do is just kind of use, um, it's not like you're just kind of soloing multiband compressors. So let's say if we have, just open up particular projects. So let's say if we go back to this project, I'll go to my mix console. And say just as an insert, there's kind of a whole slew of multiband plugins, but let's say if I just want to go to like a multiband compressor, Then you could just solo particular frequency ranges. So a lot of people use like a multiband just to kind of split out different frequencies. So see if that will work for what you want to accomplish. Okay, a question. Uh, when I have a track with a segment of audio using uh, ARA extension, if I select tape machine style monitoring and try to record in that track after the error clip, I get an audio dropout error message on PC. So, so let's give it a quick shot here. It's fine. Okay, so let's just say if I do some ARA editing, you may just have to actually come over here. So let's just get to audio and I'll just do some quick uh, spectral layers on it. Okay, so let's say if I just wanted to get rid of that and let's try recording after. I'll just arm this track for record. And I 
believe I had the tape machine style monitoring on. Okay, so um, if I select tape machine style monitoring and try to record on that track after the ARA clip, I get an audio dropout error message on PC. Um, see, just out of curiosity, if you've done that, um, you might have to try, and depending on what ARA selection you're doing, but if you try going maybe to audio uh, and choosing bounce selection and replace events, um, you can see where I kind of had drawn that out, but I didn't have any problems. But if you have uh, if you have a project, or if you could tell me Ed uh, what ARA to editor you're using, that might help as well. But if you could always email me a project or more info at clubcubase at steinberg.de, we may be able to still catch it in the hangout if you leave a comment as well. Uh, question a major Cubase update May 26th have a lot of new functions. I wonder if more of the new crash recovery, it is an automatic, uh, recovery start Cubase. Can you explain more? Um, so I think this is with the 10.5.2 version. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, what could happen is third party plugins that crash Cubase. And if that happens, Cubase will kind of start up in a, it could start up into a diagnostic mode, allowing you to bypass uh, the computer preferences or to bypass plugins uh, the next time you boot up. So if a plugin causes a particular uh, problem in your project, you could choose to bypass it and then start and perhaps save that project under a different name if needed. So it really kind of helps with some uh, plugin instability or plugin crashes with different issues. Okay, let's go through some more questions. Okay, so uh, question, how can you achieve a decent uh, symbol world and groove agent? Greetings from Greece. All right, so let's give it a shot. Just try one of the stock kits. All right, so let me just find the find my correct octave here. Just see what uh, notes I'm actually spitting out here real quick. So like, let's got to make that a little louder. Just, I'm not sure if you're trying to do more of a kind of a crescendo, kind of more of a cinematic kind of roll, but let's give this a shot and see. So just kind of adjusting the velocity
I mean, it could also change depending upon the actual kit. But if you try lower velocities, you know, you may be able to accomplish. So if you have kind of a crescendo. that may that may help you with it but you know try try ex experimenting especially with velocity okay so let's go ahead and move on so we have people from hungary and dominican republic Okay, uh, hi, uh, any advice to find a right loop on Groove Agent? For example, an easy drummer, we have a feature called tap to find. We tap the main elements and we have suggestions based on that. So if you wanted to kind of come over here, there's not like a tap to find function. So let's say if I'm And I wanted to come over here to styles, but I think this is pretty easy to kind of navigate where you could choose, okay, I want this to be more fusion styles. And then you could just hit the, and try out different styles this way. And at this point, you could just kind of navigate between different metadata as well. So let's say if I want to try. So let's say you want to come over here to the kit. You could just try out these different styles very easily. Just and hear them in real time with the projects. I'm just kind of hitting the down arrow. But you could say I'm, I'm looking for funk rock in this family. And if you want to do more like the Marco Miniman ones. This way you can kind of keep the same. So this way you can kind of find it based upon different style. So it may not be kind of the tap to find like you would normally have in other programs, but you could actually just kind of search through different metadata quite quickly. Okay. Okay, so just seeing a comment, uh, I feel like I can make music, but I'm not fluid with the DAW in general. What can y'all recommend? You know, just learn one new little, you know, learn to accomplish one thing at a time. And think of your, your DAW, you know, uh, it says, you know, why you can make music. Think of your DAW as an instrument. You know, so the first time you sat down at a piano or a guitar or a drum set or a bass, you know, think about approaching uh, Cubase that way. You know, you're not going to be, you know, like the best guitar player the first time you sit down. But, you know, if you practice, um, you know, just like you would an instrument that you, you could learn your Cubase and be very fast and proficient at it. Just think, think of it like an instrument uh, and then a lot of the paradigms will make sense. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Uh, at Cubase, is it possible to import signature track from another project? Uh, it seems not to be possible. I think the signature track is actually going to be uh, carried over with the tempo track. Uh, so let's come over here. I'll add, let's say, a tempo and signature track. Okay, so let's say I have my tempo changes here.
Okay, so let's say I have this as my tempo and signature track and we go to file to export. Uh, let's export a tempo track. We'll call it June 9th. I will come over here to a new project. And let's import a tempo track. Okay, and now we will come over here and let's add a signature track and add our tempo track. So there you can see kind of when you export a tempo track that that will include all of the signature track uh, and tempo track simultaneously. So export uh, a tempo track and then import the tempo track and that will import the tempo and signature. Okay. Okay, so question, when using chord pad, the press note is also played. How to mute that to hear only the assigned chord? All right, so let me go ahead and get a track with chord track set up here. Okay, so let's say if I come over here to chord pads. Okay, so let's see. Um, so when using the chord pad, the press note is also played. Uh, how to mute that to hear only the assigned chord. You could maybe come over here. Uh, if you have it set to all MIDI inputs. Um, so when you come here, if you have that set to all MIDI inputs, let me just try this quickly. Okay, so we can see we'll have, these are the notes that we triggered, but I think if we now set this to inputs from the chord pad, and we just go ahead and hit record again. So I think if you try setting the MIDI input to chord pads, that, that may, looks like it still may have recorded it. Um, but I think it's fine if it's kind of still the chord pads are active. So, but try just um, for the MIDI input here and it could be just a quick, Let me just see if there's a setting in here. But try setting it to just uh, the chord pads as, as its particular input and see if that makes a difference for you. 
Okay, so we have a question. What is automation trim? Okay, so let me go ahead and drop a loop in here quickly. Okay, so let's say if I have this set here, so let's say if I have some quick automation going on here. So let's say we have Okay, so let's come here and I'll just duplicate that automation there. Okay, so now we're gonna put open up our automation panel and we're just gonna set this into trim mode. And now as we're kind of doing the automation, I could bring it down. And you can see that as I've kind of just dropped the automation, so let's say if I bring this up here, kind of that automation level has jumped up. And now if I bring it down, so we still kind of see the existing automation uh, that was there. And as I kind of adjust it up or down, and if we wanted to, I think if we, Over here, we could just say, uh, and then we could say, you know, if you wanted to go to the settings, we could just choose to do the trim automatically. So let's say if I wanted to do the trim manually, so let's say I come here and that's my automation and I adjust up that now we could just, whenever we on the pass end, now that could just kind of bring it down. So I could kind of keep the overall automation values, but I could just kind of increase or decrease the actual automation values there. So that's kind of what the trim mode's intended to do. Okay, just thanks for all the great questions from everyone. Okay, so a question, can you go through the various link types in the mix console? So yeah, we'll take a look at that. We just add some tracks. Okay, so now that we're in the mix console here, um, you know, so if we wanted to, so let's say we have these particular channels, let me just unsolo. Okay, so if we have all these channels, uh, there's two different types of linking. One is a very handy uh, temporary link, and that's called Q-Link. And we could turn this on by hitting Alt or Option uh, plus Shift. Uh, and then, or we could click here. And now as I move particular parameters at that point, we could just temporarily link those. I hit the keyboard shortcut again or disable it here. I can move them independently. But now all the selected channels, I could just hold down alt and shift and move. And now I wanted to tweak one, move, tweak one. So that's a very handy one of doing that. Now that we could also define different link groups. So if I wanted to say, I wanted all these particular channels, let's say these are my drums. So I could 
create a link group here. We'll give it a name. And let's say these are I'll create another link group and let's call these guitars. And if we wanted to, we could now come over here and choose different elements. So let's say the guitars, I wanted to link panning and EQ. So at this point, if I wanted to just adjust my volume here, and if I go to my panning for particular tracks, those are independent in my drum group. But if I go to my panning and guitars, these will all be panned together. So you can pick and choose different components which will be linked together. And if you wanted to override a link temporarily, just hold down the Alt or Option key, and then you could tweak as needed right there. So those are kind of the two main link groups. You could also choose to... Uh, you know, if you wanted to get rid of a particular link group, uh, you could choose to use a VCA fader for the link. And now we could have a VCA fader that will control uh, the volume of those different channels as well. So you have kind of the quick link and a permanently defined link. Um, so I think once you're, you know, I, I tend to find myself using the quick link a lot just for little stuff because you may not want to always be permanently linked, but sometimes when you, uh, you know, are working in a big mix, you may always want your drums or background vocals to be permanently linked. So it really could depend upon the project. Okay, so uh, in score editor, how can I move a group of notes uh, that triplets, tuplets? It seems when I nudge them left, it does not retain the notes being triplets or tuplets. Okay. All right, so let me just create a quick part here. Okay, so I'll go to my score editor. Let's just do a quick. All right, so sorry about that. All right, so I had my snap set wrong. Let me just go ahead and insert, let's say, some eighth notes. All right, so let's say I'll do some eighth notes now. I 
Let's do some eighth node triplets. Okay, so let me just Okay, so let's say we have this in our score editor Okay, so I'll select all the notes, and I think if I just so depending on so as we kind of go through, um, so I have toplets, I have quarter notes, as well as triplets here. But as I go through my different, um, as I nudge them over, I'm just holding down Control and just the arrow. And let's say if I just wanted to move these over, let's say a quarter note. So just selecting all of the events that they kind of nudge as expected. So my toplets, uh, make sure, you know, cause when you nudge, it could be really de determined the nudge factor or how much it's gonna nudge it to the left or right. It's gonna be based on a quantized value. So as I've done this and I nudge to the right, um, we'll see that these triplets will be on beat one. And now I'll, I'll nudge to the right, these triplets will go to beat two, etc. And if I nudge to the left, all of my tuplets and triplets are all kind of nudging as, uh, as expected, but it depends, make sure that you have the correct uh, quantize there the snap value set there. So as soon as you do that, then everything seems to nudge uh, as I would anticipate. So make sure that you have the right value set in the snap value. Okay, uh, Greg, question. I accidentally deleted a few tracks and I'm using some data recovery software, but they didn't open. So I wondered if I could send you the project. Uh, sorry, my timeline just jumped down. Okay, uh, so I... So once again, question, I accidentally deleted a few tracks. I'm using some data recovery software, but they didn't open. So I wondered if I could send you the project and see if you can get it to work. I'm not uh, like a data recovery expert by any means, but I know going through different clients that have accidentally deleted like, you know, like <clears throat> entire artist songs in the past that the only time that they were able to really recover is if they didn't write any files to that particular sec, like to that drive. Um, so I think once you've kind of written the data again, if you've deleted something and then written it, that it's really hard to get back. So I'm not sure, uh, you're probably better off kind of if you're working with some data recovery software, those people are probably more, uh, have better expertise in that than I would. So I'm not sure. You could you could try to email me a link to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de, but I probably wouldn't be of much help with that. You're probably better off again going with your data recovery people. Um, so you see, hi Greg, is there a way to convert a stereo track to mono in a project without splitting it? Uh, left and right meaning a fusion of a stereo track into mono not really it's going to be kind of a stereo or mono but if you have like a actual stereo file here as you mentioned you could just go to your project and convert 
tracks. So you could say multi-channel to mono, and that would automatically kind of, you know, allow you to see, uh, you know, your two mono files right there. But there isn't kind of a fusion between the two different types of tracks. Okay, question. Um, can you show how I can move an audio event with all of its overlaps? I just want to click and drag it, but it'll move only the top most overlap. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's say if I have a number of files that are kind of overlapped here. So let's say if I come here and I move the other, the underlying ones are still going to be there. So let's see if I So if they are, depending how it's set up, you may have them in lanes. This is kind of the typical way that you would see a lot of stacked files. So here you could have kind of everything stacked and if it's showing up as lanes, let me see if I could move all of the lanes. So try, there's a good chance that your data is going to show up as lanes. So try opening the lane view and selecting all of the different lanes and moving them simultaneously. And I think that will do the trick for you. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how do you export video in Cubase Artist? I don't think the Cubase Artist version has the video export. So I think the Cubase Pro is when you come over here, you just choose to export video and this came in the 10.5 version. So I think if you need to export uh, your video in Cubase Artist, you may wanna consider upgrading to uh, directly to Cubase Pro for that. All right, good to see Michael from Weatherford, Texas. All right. Okay, so we have a question. How do you render in place multiple MIDI tracks? Okay. Okay, so let me just get this set up. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some 21st century composition here. So if I wanted to just render these in place, I could select the events or the actual tracks here. So if I want to do this for multiple MIDI parts, I'll select the tracks. Let's go to edit to render in place. I'll just get to my render settings. We'll choose our dry. We'll do it as one event. We could disable the source tracks or mute the source tracks or just remove them entirely. So let's just say I'll re I'll disable the source tracks. I'll hit render. 
And now I'll just kind of go through and render in place each of the files. And now the instruments have been disabled. So I won't take any more, uh, any more CPU cycles. So that's a quick way to render in place multiple MIDI tracks. Okay, so just saying a question. Hi, Greg, you answered my question on June 5th. He asked me to send the Cubase file, but it got returned by the webmaster. What is the correct email address? Um, it's probably, it may be better if you're sending a, an actual file to send like a download link, but if you send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de, and if you have like a WeTransfer or Dropbox or something like that, it would be happy. That may be easier for me to download it as opposed to receiving the attachment. Okay, so a question, how to set up hotkey for hide disabled tracks. Okay, so let's come over here. I'm not sure if there's a hotkey for that, but before I come up with a way, I'll check. Okay, so I've made a, uh, a keyboard. If we get to the project logical editor, we'll make a a logic a project logical editor preset, which can then be triggered directly with a keyboard shortcut. Okay, so now what I'm telling you, if the property is set to, property is set to disabled, like these tracks that we see here, we're gonna go to track operation, hide track enable. So if I do this right, I'll just click apply, and then that will hide those particular tracks. So let's say if I will undo this. So if all your tracks are set up, so what you could do again is uh, property, property is set to disabled. And then track operation, hide track is set to enable. And now at this point, all these tracks are disabled. We can choose to, all right. So this will now come over here and hide all the disabled tracks. And to assign that once you save that as a preset, and I think I've created a preset here for hide disabled tracks, go to your key commands and you'll see process project logical editor, and then just assign a keyboard shortcut to that preset. And then you could have a keyboard shortcut that will again, hide the disabled tracks. So make a project logical editor and then boom. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, Greg, hopefully you can say a few words on how to use WaveLab to use uh, to useful complete work with Cubase. Why would I want to use WaveLab or skip some steps in Cubase because WaveLab does it better? So you know, I think sometimes you know, let's see, go ahead and fire up WaveLab here. 
you know, Wave Lab is kind of a different beast. Um, and I, I consider it kind of like when I wanted to take a, you know, whole project and be able Just see if I can. You know, some some things that Wave Lab does, you know, in, incredibly well is, you know, going to be, uh, you know, restoration plugins if you need to do restoration functions. Um, but I think one of the the hidden gems of Wave Lab is uh, in the master rig as a processing. So if I wanted to just open this, we could add um you know different limiters we have different modules so we have eqs and this is very similar to frequency but we could also have dynamic eqs different multi-band saturations a multi-band imager uh, we could take these different functions i think that the metering is pretty exceptional i'm not sure if this is routed you know having my level meter, loudness meter, his, you know, if I want to see my phase scope on. You know, I think also once you start getting into like the montage editor, so uh, for doing, you know, if you wanted to actually do like a full uh, CD, you know, being able to come here and say, let me see if I have, um, You know, so if I wanted to take this file and just kind of drag and drop it into. So, you know, if I had multiple tracks that were laid out on a CD, you know, one of the things that's super helpful also is to just be able to take like, you know, if you had like six or seven tracks or 10 tracks uh, to be able to do meta normalizing. So if you wanted to just say, uh, you know, match the loudest clip to come over here and just say, okay, now I just wanted to equalize all of my different clips via RMS or via loudness units uh, to be able to put in, you know, a bunch of different metadata as well. So, you know, different metadata options. So if you want to put in all your AS and MP3 tag information, different loops, uh, and be able to burn CDs, you know, which is still very common and to deliver multiple formats. There's also, uh, when you go to render, you know, there is a, you know, different presets, but you could have a multi render. So when you have everything kind of done in wave lab, uh, and you're like, okay, I need to deliver a 32 bit 190K, a 2496, a 2448, a 16 bit 44.1, an MP3 in this resolution in AAC. You could just simply have WaveLab do a multi render. So when you render your final product, it could automatically do multiple file formats all at once. So I think, you know, like, you know, for me, WaveLab is like the tool that can really take like your final product to the next level. And I think it's a great investment for that and being able to kind of see it a bit differently than what a DAW treats it as, uh, I think is also kind of 
uh, a, a useful tool for that. But, you know, if you're doing very precise mastering and editing and getting into more, uh, you know, I want it to, like, as I'm doing editing here, I need to do, like, you know, spectral repair. There's going to be, you know, very comprehensive uh, spectral editing as well built into WaveLab. So it's a great kind of finishing tool that you could use with your Cubase. And I think, you know, people that have it find it to be very, you know, useful tool for them. Uh, I know a lot of composers that that is like their secret weapon is they will just kind of deliver stuff in WaveLab that's kind of optimized for broadcast and their songs get picked uh, other over other people very easily because they do use WaveLab and it gives them the edge and the sound. Okay. Okay, so just see, uh, Greg, hitting uh, record on the monitoring automatically turns on how to not turn on automatically tried in preferences. Thank you very much from Athens, Greece. Uh, I think this is maybe from the monitoring. So let's just say, um, I think if we go to your preferences and you set the VST to manual, that as soon as we're recording here, that it won't. So let's just say as we punch in, that it's not monitoring. So maybe I'm misunderstanding, but check your preferences and you could set the auto monitoring to manual if you wanted to. Okay, so let's see, are there any key commands macros for one, selecting activating project window two? Uh, or selecting activating project window um, to selecting the first MIDI note automatically when you open a MIDI part or score editors. Okay, so let's see. If I have multiple projects open, not sure if there's a key command for that. You know, some of the behaviors changed in 10.5. Um, with this, so as I deactivate a project, um, it used to be, or if I close this project, it used to be that it would activate other projects automatically. And that behavior has changed in 10.5. So it used to be that it would, if you had like six projects open, that it could, would automatically activate the next project. Let's see if there's a key command for activating the project. I'm not sure if there is. I think it's kind of chosen to, because it may not know which project it, that you want to activate. Um, so I don't think that there's gonna be one. Yeah, so I don't think there's going to be one for the project in 10.5 because what would happen is we'd have a lot of composers whose templates could take like a minute or two to load up. And anytime that they close the project, it would automatically instantiate and activate another project. And they complained about that. So we kind of changed the behavior with that. So I don't think that's going to. And because we don't want you don't know which project that you want active that's why it's not really set up as a key command or macro um but uh but i may have just totally misunderstood that so let's say selecting the project window i think uh, now that i read reread this i think that there is a key command for this um 
that might be like active window. I say is maybe a, a preference. Uh, I'm just kind of blanking. Let me just see if it's. I'm trying to remember the name of the command, but I believe there is a command because you kind of like when I work with new Oj, I have a preference set to activate kind of the uh, particular project window. Um, I'll see if I can remember what it is, but let's see if we go to selecting the first note. Sorry about that for misunderstanding. All right, let's see if we can make a logical editor. So I'm not seeing a way of doing that, but I'll see if I can do a quick uh, of selecting the very first note in an event. I'm, it can probably be done, but I may have to play around with it. If you want to email me at uh, clubcubase at steinberg.de, um, I could do some research on it so I don't have to have brain cramps in front of everyone here. Okay, so... Um, Let's see, uh, question, why is Cubase harder to operate than Cubasis? I use both systems. You know, Cubase has a lot more uh, capabilities, so with more capabilities comes more complexity too, so. And I think Cubasis is really kind of optimized for like a touch screen and using your fingers. Um, so I know probably a lot of people that started on Cubase may have a harder time going to Cubasis and, and vice versa. So, Okay, so let's go ahead. Okay, question. When I set up a chord on a chord pad and copy it to the chord track, it loses the voicing, uh, resets how to keep the voicing I set up on the chord pad. So let's come over here to the chord pads. OK, 
Okay, so just kind of looking at the voicing indicated there, and it's all right. So that seems to kind of just. Sorry, you hear my son playing piano in the background, probably. All right, so that looks like it kind of matched the voicing here visually. So let's say if I wanted to do a different voicing and we drag that out. Right, that seemed to match, so let's come here. Drag this out. So this all seemed to be correlating over, um, but the one thing that may affect it is as you kind of drag uh, the chords in see if you have different voicing options set up when you go to the chords um, so you may have voicing options here that are overriding but that seems to kind of if I wanted to look at these three together and we look at it in our editor that those voicings kind of seem to correlate to what was done there, but make sure that on the actual track itself that you don't have voicing indicators because that may be overriding it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna have an instrument track with VSTI, how to switch to a MIDI track. Um, so instrument tracks and MIDI tracks, well, they'll be, you know, very similar, you know, can be different. So if I have an instrument track here, and then all of a sudden I choose to uh, work with an external device. Um, what you would need to do is to just add a MIDI track right below, and then you could just copy that data. And if you, like we moved it down first, if I hold down Alt or Option and then Control or Command, we could constrain the direction. So that way, so once you've defined something as an instrument track, it's not going to be able to be sent out to a MIDI track, but just right click add a MIDI track and just move the data over. And then you could send it out to, uh, to a MIDI track if you wanted to. Okay. Um, Okay, is there a shortcut easy way to move several selected audio events that have empty spaces between them and get them right next to each other to close the gaps? All right, let's take a look. Okay, so let's say as we're looking with this, I think if we change our grid mode here to events that you could just let's just say if I wanted to come here, if I nudge, you know, we could at this point just automatically nudge and it will snap directly to the event. So let's say if I'm here, you know, this way it's not, you know, we see these events aren't going to be aligned to the grid whatsoever. And then you could just have it automatically just kind of nudge 
directly to the event. So it'll just snap directly to the event. Like so. So try when you see the grid uh, type instead of grid. So now when I have grid set here, it's going to snap directly to the beat. But if that is not on the beat, that's going to kind of snap like so. But if we have this set to events instead, it'll just automatically snap directly to the beginning or ending of a previous event. So if I move this over here and now I want this to snap directly to the event, regardless of where it falls on the grid, just change your, your grid type to events. And I think that will help you with that. Okay, so just seeing Michael mentioning uh, that he's using George Mon for engineering. So yeah, George is a great guy. So good to see you guys are working together. Okay, so I see a question. I would use Cubase in a heartbeat, but why does it have to a dongle? Um, all right, so it says not even a USB, not even a USB C dongle. Of that please, can you think about machine activation or cloud based activation, please? I know that there's people they're obviously looking into it, but obviously the USB dongle is works very well. If you have a USB C port, you know, spend seven dollars and get a USB C to USB A hub. That's what I use on my MacBook, and you know, works great. Um, so I don't have any problems with that. So. Um, you know, after, after recently having to rebuild an entire, uh, studio PC, I was like really happy to have everything on e-licensor when having to, you know, just redid my home studio computer and just got it activated again after several years of not using it and found that the dongle just worked really well. And if you look at the number of USB-C devices versus USB-A, it's still going to be probably under 1%. So just, you know, most of your MIDI keyboards, your MIDI controls, your, you know, are going to be using USB, your MIDI interfaces, MIDI controllers, audio interfaces are often using USB. So, you know, you could just hook it up within a hub, you know, you're still connecting other USB devices to your studio. So I think it, the dongle works pretty well. So, but I understand your frustration with that. And as someone mentioned also because Cubase Pro is the only DAW that hasn't been cracked in a long time, so. Okay, so uh, we may have covered this a little bit, but what's the difference between all MIDI input uh, versus chord pads versus my MIDI keyboard? It used to be that, um, you know, when you have chord pads that, you know, they, you know, if you had something in record enable, you could have the chord pads would go into all in all MIDI inputs. Um, so you couldn't record one track with chord pads and another track using a, a standard MIDI, like your oxygen USB controller, which a lot of people wanted to do. So this way, when they broke out, they made a chord pads MIDI input driver. That way, one track could be inputted from chord pads and another track you can record simultaneously through your oxygen 49. So it allows you to kind of have both of those at once simultaneously. Okay, uh, question, is it possible to find the loudness of a track output after fader in terms of uh, luffs, say from bar three to bar 10? So let's say if I wanted to find my loudness units for a particular range here. I could select with, let's say my range tool, go to your audio menu and go to statistics. 
And then in statistics here, you can automatically see a lot of different elements, including all of your loudness units for the selected uh, part for the selected range. So just select it, go to your audio menu to statistics. And then you'll see kind of all that, all that information directly there. Okay, so uh, Greg, is there a way to revert a stereo audio track to mono and vice versa? So, you know, it's when we wanted to, you know, it's not gonna be a switch where you say stereo mono directly here, but if we have a stereo track, I could, like I have the, these files right here, I could come right over here to my project and we'll convert tracks and we'll say multi-channel to mono. And then we have those split right there. And if I select these particular tracks, I could do the opposite and we'll go to convert tracks, mono to multi-channel, um, and we'll choose our destination format as stereo. And then you could do it like that. Okay, let's just go on. Thanks for all the great questions. If you've learned a tip or trick, please feel free to uh, give a thumbs up and make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Just seeing some more comments on the mono stereo track and kind of add the right one. So, uh, hi Greg, is there any chance of you or someone making a comprehensive video and using Cubase Pro's ambisonic features? Um, it's kind of on my to-do list. Uh, I've had some projects that got freed up, so uh, I'll see if I could uh, put it to more the top of my list for upcoming videos. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, okay, just, um, Okay, so I see uh, idea to get vocals more clear, distinct. Um, idea to get vocals more clear, distinct. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when we're going vocals to make kind of clarity, you know, just like EQ can make a big difference with that. So just a little bit here, we'll open up kind of a big project. So I'll we'll take a look, see what my friend Clay did. Uh, he always makes incredible, correct, incredibly correct decisions. So we'll just kind of give you an idea. So we in a pretty dense mix. You know, I, I find kind of adding some, you know, make sure that you don't record with an overly bright microphone 
Uh, sometimes adding EQ is pretty easy to make a vocal kind of stand out in the mix pretty well. But even on this, is So, you know, but often, you know, to when, you know, it was like I heard a, a great quote once from a, a wonderful mix engineer, um, you know, one of the best quotes I ever heard, and I appreciate this as a bass player. He's like, when a bass sounds bad in a mix, it's never the bass's fault. Um, so sometimes if a vocal isn't cutting through, maybe it's another part or another track in the mix that's causing it not to cut through. And it's not the vocal that's the problem. It's something else. So that's um, something to kind of check out as well. Okay, uh, so question, what is what are quick controls used for? So let me just set up a new project here. Thanks for all the great questions. All right, so when I come here, so when we have a lot of instruments and when we start dealing with audio tracks, we could have quick controls deal with kind of like eight go-to parameters. So at this point, I can see uh, like when I play this piano part, that these will kind of be for this particular patch. I can make it brighter, add more. Kind of the eight go-to parameters here. And if I go to a different keyboard, so let's say if I just wanted to come here, maybe more to... you'll get eight different parameters. So if I wanted less reverb. Now these are quick controls and these quick controls can be controlled using a typical MIDI controller. So we could have VST quick controls and we could use our MIDI, if we have a controller with MIDI faders on it, we could click on learn and move these particular parameters. So now when I play, I could move my faders on my controller keyboard. And be able to control those different parameters. And as we wanted to just write that as automation, I could come here and just sequence. And we could look at the quick controls, you know, directly here. And as I would move those, we could change the sound. Now, so we could have quick controls for particular instruments. And if you wanted to get to the point where if you wanted to assign your own quick controls, you could right click and then you could actually set the different parameters to various quick controls. So you could say, I, I wanted to assign you know this parameter right click and you could assign it to quick controls now you could also have track quick controls and we could set these up to be kind of the same thing so when i go to an audio track such as what we see here we could go to our quick controls and we could activate these and we could just open up a particular preset so now um I have this preset, so a, a volume pan. I could have all of my sends. I could have different presets, and you could make your own presets as you see fit just by kind of clicking here and choosing different parameters. So you know that every time you want to go to an audio track and you have eight faders, uh, I wanted to now fader one is my volume, two is pan, three is my low cut, on and off my I could change the frequency my high cut on and off and you could come here and just adjust you know sends one and two so these are kind of like your eight go-to parameters so 
many MIDI controllers will have, you know, eight sliders on it. So now you could use those eight sliders to every time you select an audio channel that these eight sliders do this and save it as a preset and leave that turned on in your template. So that's kind of some of the idea behind quick control. So you could actually get them using, using them to control parameters that you want to. Okay, so question, hi Greg, can you show how to use the MIDI control insert to write MIDI data to a track before recording? I can't get data to write to the part. Um, I can't get data to write to the part before recording. Any ideas important for film scoring? So let's take a look. Let's add a MIDI track or All right. So as I want to come here, let's go to our MIDI inserts and I have my track quick controls, uh, my MIDI controls here. All right, and this will allow us to say, okay, I want a value of 60, you know, 72 for my mod wheel to start. I wanted uh, expression to be at a value of 64. Okay, so I have this part here. Let me try just going to MIDI to freeze MIDI modifiers. And now when I go to look at the list editor, See, you just see if there's any filters that are on. Just see if I write these in. Let me see if it makes a difference if I, there's actual parts. I'm gonna change one preference here, not in my Mac. See if I had to have maybe some notes in first. Yes, I thought it would be done. I'll play around with it some more, but I thought that writing the freeze MIDI modifiers usually kind of writes in that control data. Um, let me see if that makes a difference. Yeah, I would expect it to work kind of with the uh, freeze MIDI modifiers for work, but it doesn't seem to be, but I'll, I'll mention that. Okay, so 
Uh, so question, when I make a couple of MIDI tracks solo and then I mute one of them, the audio channels of the rest become muted. However, I could see that the track still shows solo uh, and I'm using rock instrument. Um, so let me just add a couple MIDI tracks. I'm going to try the quick control things. Or let me just jump back and see if the quick control makes, if it writes onto an actual uh, instrument track instead. Sorry, just divert. See if that makes a difference whether it's a MIDI track or an instrument track. That doesn't seem to make a difference. So, all right. I'll, okay. So, um, all right. Going back to our solo question. Uh, when I make a couple of MIDI tracks solo, then I mute one of them. The audio channels of the rest become muted. However, I can see that the track still shows solo. Um, and I'm using rock or maybe rack instruments. Okay. So let's, so I've got to create a couple of these. Okay, so let's say if you solo some of these. Okay. So it says uh, that the audio tracks become soloed. So let's say you mute some of those, then. All right, so let's just look at it here. So let's say we go to So we get a prologue here, then that will become unmuted. Try holding down. I think it's maybe if you do um, control or command and then click on the solo, then that could give you just kind of the solo. And I think that may kind of solve the issue for you. So try command or control and then before holding down the solo. Okay, uh, how do I fit uh, recorded vocals sent by a client to an instrumental track with the time warp tool? Um, you know, if you have, let me see if I have a particular project here. Um, So, you know, if you, you know, a lot of times what you want to do is, you know, probably just make the, make sure that the tempo is set correctly to both of them. Um, I did a tutorial and as I was just, I'll take, see if I could find this one project, see if, if I have it on this computer.
Yeah, I don't think I have it. But, you know, if you need to take, let's say if I have a particular, uh, I'll just start off with. You know, I think a big part of what you want to do is just to make sure that you have different tempo stuff. So let's say if we have a, a file here that's not line, aligned to the tempo. So I'm going to click here and as we do this, so I'm going to do a, a tempo detection from the project menu. So I'll come right over here, do tempo detection, analyze, and we'll listen for it. Let's do an offbeat correction. So let's say if I want to take that particular file um, and I want to find like the downbeat to it now. So let's say our downbeat is right here. And we can see that this file is gonna have different tempo changes. So if you have a project that's gonna have different tempo changes constantly, you can kind of come over here and if you go to your audio menu, select uh, advanced and do a set definition from tempo. And then we could save that to the file or directly to the project. Um, and let's say if I wanted to take a different uh, let's see if I have a different two track file. All right, so let's say this is a, a completely different. The same. So I will come here and do a tempo detection of this file. So if it's kind of the same tempo, it's you don't have to do a lot of editing. You could just kind of line it up. But if you have two different things that are two different tempos, I can now do the tempo detection of this. And again, I will go to my project menu and go to advanced under audio. And we'll set definition from tempo. So now I could just kind of drag that tempo data is embedded. And if I wanted to make this into its own track, let me, I'll just. And this will probably be just horribly musically inappropriate. But um, I had a good example and I did a, a tutorial video. I think the last range of videos I did on the Greg Undo Q&A series will kind of show this. So now if I just kind of drop this in, let's say. That this will now be in musical mode. So now this tempo of this particular project, since it's in musical mode, is automatically matching the tempo of the of the jazz track. It's it's I had I had a musical example that was kind of more appropriate, but if you kind of figure out what the tempo is of both of the files and put them into like different uh, areas of time, and then do the audio advanced and write the tempo set definition from tempo, then that will be able to kind of drag that metadata from that file and be able to warp this automatically to the new tempo. But if you want to hear like a good musical example as a composer had sent me, uh, it was like a get me out of jail free. I have a deadline in an hour and someone recorded a violin part to like a Christmas piece that was like just completely off time. 
and within a matter of like 30 seconds you can make it just fit without having to stretch each single note Okay, so question, how do I set up Cubase to accept MIDI from my newly purchased used Roland Phantom G6? I got for a MIDI controller. I need to know how to sync transport controls to Phantom and make Cubase master. Um, so, you know, any, as long as you have the, uh, the, it's probably, I assume the Phantom will have a USB MIDI driver if you're using USB. Uh, so if you have the driver installed, it's going to be able to use and accept MIDI input. So, you know, as soon as you have a MIDI track, you should hit MIDI and then see the activity show up here on the right hand side. So you should be able to see your MIDI indicator there. And for configuring it for transport, there's a good chance that maybe the transport functionality could be tied to a Mackie control. So if it is, you can come over here and click on the, if you go to, sorry, I'll go faster, go to your studio menu, to studio setup, click on the plus sign, then you can see, like if it works as a Mackie control, you can add a Mackie control. Uh, and at that point, you know, define the input and output where the transport is going. And that's how a lot of keyboards will work. Uh, for transport, if it doesn't do that, if it doesn't work as a Mackie control for transport, what you could do is just go to uh, add a generic MIDI remote. And then you could just come over here and say this, you know, is probably going to transmit a MIDI note message. Uh, learn that MIDI note message and say that's going to be this MIDI note message. And you could click on learn. So I'll click right there. Um, and then I just hit play on my controller, go to transport, go to device, and you could choose start. So now when I hit that button again, that will automatically can go through and just start. So try setting up as a Mackie control if it does that, that may be more comprehensive for transport, but you could also do it through a generic remote as well for your transport. All right, good to see Grant Nicholas on the Hangout. Okay, I see a question. Got four CMC controllers for $150. Was I robbed? No, I think the CMCs are really clever little controllers that, you know, it's kind of, if you're not familiar, they're like little modular controllers. So I think that's a great deal. So I think you robbed someone. Okay, so I see another question again. I know we covered this a little earlier. Any easy and fastest way to remove inserted plugin? Uh, and again, the easiest and fastest way is when you go to your inserts is just in case you missed it, just to drag it out of the inserts and that will remove it for you. Uh, so I see a question. Hi, Greg. I'm from South India. Do you have uh, any India rhythms? Uh, I may not have a lot on my different on my work computer, um, but when you wanted to come over here, you could just say, let's go to loops. Um, and you could just kind of start looking through different um, categories. So So, but if you wanted to just kind of look for loops and samples here, you could look in different libraries. So if you wanted to kind of come over here, you could just say, let's look for in all media types and you could just, you know, look for different, you know, uh, I don't have all the factory content, but
So, but you know, check out different ethnic uh, areas or different beats. Um, so there's, you know, I don't have a lot of third party stuff, but there's lots of different loops and stuff that you could access. Okay, so um, just a kind of a variation of what we were just doing. Um, let me just revert this. Okay, so uh, I have some old tracks that were not recorded to a click. Is there a way to modify the track so that they are on a fixed or single tempo like 120 instead of 110 to 130? So just like we did before, we'll come over here, do a tempo detection, let's say our jazz piece here. So now that I'm here, I'm just gonna select the file, get a project um, and go to tempo detection, analyze. Okay, just do an offbeat correction. And then go to your audio menu to advance. And again, do the set definition from tempo. We could store this in a project or within the audio file itself. Now that we've done that, we have the tempo map and we can see it's gonna be fluctuating. So let's say this is between roughly 140-ish. I can now just hit a steady tempo, let's say I want to be exactly 140. So we can see the original tempo variations here and we could do this for a multi-track project as well. Uh, and we can see that the steady tempo that we've just written in. So now every beat is stretching. Uh, every beat is stretching to comply to a steady tempo. So that's a great way of being able to do that. Okay. Um, so, I, so I see a question. I tried to assign a key command for a logical editor preset I created. However, when scrolling through the process, logical editor preset in the key commands box, I can't find it. Any ideas? I've never had it not show up. Um, try to go to, you know, your key commands or, you know, if you go to the logical editor, you just add a MIDI track. Just add some data in here. So I will just do a quick preset for, um, you know, check to see, you'll see the presets kind of in here. So let's say I will And I will just store this preset. We'll call it June 9th Hangout. Okay, so now when I go into my key commands and we go to our process logical editor There's my June 9th Hangout. Make sure also when you're doing this, there's a process logical editor, but there's also a whole folder of process project logical editor. 
So make sure that you you don't have the wrong folder opened accidentally. That's one thing that could get confused. Okay, so I see question, is it possible to have the score editor show marker IDs along with descriptions and the score automatically? Uh, currently, the editors don't have, so when we come here, we don't see any indication of the markers. Um, I know it's a common feature request, so maybe we'll see it in the future, but currently there isn't a way to see the markers, uh, but I know what a lot of people will do is kind of look at the score editor in the lower zone and that way you can see kind of the markers aligned with, you know, editing in the lower zone, but not directly in the score editor. Okay, so I see a question, what sample rate should I use for composing? Um, I know a lot of composers work at 48K, um, and especially when they're doing uh, a lot of stuff for video, they find that's a more common sample rate for working with audio that's been embedded in video, such as like maybe a temp track or dialogues or rough sound effects. Um, so, and that at 96K, sometimes it can put more strain on your computer. So I think a lot of composers use, uh, you know, basically work at 48K. Okay, good to see Pablo from Spain on a Hangout. Okay, so I see a question. Is there a way to copy modulation automation back to MIDI CC within Key Editor? Uh, I know there's a way to extract uh, MIDI CC to automation. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. So I think if we come over here to our functions uh, and go to our CC automation setup, so let's say modulation, we want it to go to automation track. So let me just go ahead and automate. Let's say I'll just, so I will, And let's see if it shows up here. Let me just see if I had that set up. Okay, so let's just I just try it with a new track here really quick. Okay, I'll just check my CC automation setup. OK, 
Okay, so that's I. So I'll just kind of take a quick look here and see if we. And let me just try to get that. Try just recording as normal MIDI. In the MIDI part. See if my modulation wheel is. Let me just check my MIDI inserts, make sure it's working. Yeah, now. So it doesn't. Looks like my modulation wheel is not working. Working, but let's see if we had automation data. If we could copy that to CC. So say if I select this here, copy, and let's say if we go into our modulation, or let's say back to any, so it doesn't look like, but my modulation wheel it doesn't seem to be working now. So, all right, so let's see if we can move on. So it does, I don't think we could copy the automation to MIDI CC, so. Okay, so I see, let's see, I did this ages ago. I'm sure, but forgot. Can you show me, us, how to extract a MIDI groove, especially velocity from, say, one bar and apply it to another event chords to create a new pattern? All right, so let's say if we... Okay, so how to save kind of a preset for velocity. So let's. Let's say I have something incredibly boring. I'll just split this up. So let's say if I have my velocity curve here and I wanted that velocity curve. So what you could do is if you wanted to save that as a preset to apply to other different parts. So let's come here. I'm going to make a copy of this and then let's fix the velocity. Okay, so we have this velocity pattern. So what I could do is go to your quantize uh, panel and we could drag the MIDI event right there. Uh, we have a choice of velocity. So we could choose our position to be 0% and our velocity to be 100%. So now that I've applied this, I could look at this and I'm going to quantize based on this. So now I'm using this as my preset. Now I hit Q and then that will apply the velocity preset that we extracted from this part into this. So now I'll just select it, hit Q and you're not quantizing the position, but just quantizing the velocity of it.
Okay, so uh, question. Hi, I work with 48K, 24-bit setup, and while importing 44.116 audio, sometimes the sound is speeded up or sped up. Rather, uh, no, it's not the musical mode. I checked. It's always the tick box to resample. So you just, you know, it, it is going to be a sample rate issue. So I think if you go to your Cubase to preferences here, we could choose to come over here and we see an event. Uh, so under editing audio uh, and on import audio files, we could choose to open the options dialog, but if you choose use settings, you could convert to project settings and copy to project folder if necessary. That way your 44.1 file will automatically turn into a 48K when you import the file and the pitch would uh, should automatically be the same for you. So without going up, because it kind of goes up like almost a semitone, but not quite so. Okay, so let's go through. Okay, so a uh, question. I want to import small samples, three seconds long, and play them back as loops via my keyboard in tempo sync to my sequence uh, i want to loop other classical music to get ideas possible so yeah you could definitely kind of take uh you know any of your different audio files that you want you know you could do this um so let's say if i was just playing uh let's add a couple of sampler tracks you know, and let's say if I come here to just drop in some samples. So if I drop that sample in, now you could place this in, you may not notice this, but you could just activate the audio warp and you could set this to music. So as soon as I come over here, um, I could now just trigger this particular sample and it will automatically sync to the tempo of the particular project. So if I wanted to come over here, let's say I wanted this to be more, you know, some other kind of loop based stuff. So let's say, Say I select this as my sampler track, and again, kind of do the same element here. Uh, put it into musical mode, so I could play back this sample. And now I want to bring the other loop in, activate the record in that track. So these will all just kind of play back. Let's find something maybe a little more. So now if I want to take that loop. I'll drag that in and put it into warp mode again. And then I could just kind of play all three of these at once. And then you could have it kind of automatically synced. So that's a, a number of ways to be able to tempo sync different stuff from your keyboard. So you, you could definitely do that with any, you know, violin part. So if you wanted to take, uh, let's say if we have like strings,
fancy than this. Just so now putting that into your tempo audio warp mode. So you can do all sorts of very creative things with that. See, comment talk back is handy to let your musicians know the coffee is ready too. Yeah, that's always a good point. You could talk about other musicians to other musicians without them realizing. Yeah. Okay, so I see a question. Uh, what about Nuendo update? We're way behind with a lot of these features. Um, yeah, keep keep looking for news this week maybe you know so i think um yeah just kind of keep your keep your ears and eyes open so and we'll get a lot of those new features i think coming soon okay just saying comment uh Hit the thumbs up if you like Cubase and Greg. You know, it's really just Cubase. So if you like Cubase, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so give a thumbs up. That's always a great thing to do. Okay, so I do not know how to turn on the volume to play Strindberg. Uh, I'm not sure if that's Steinberg, but, you know, if you you know, have, you know, your volume control, it's probably going to be set on your audio interface. So make sure that your audio interface, the volume is turned up there. And then when you go into your mix console, that should be up as well, but you should be able to see kind of your main mix console volume there. So if you wanted to be able to, you know, make that louder or softer. So. Okay, so I see uh, I do not have the menu item extensions in audio. I use 10.512, no spectral possible. <clears throat> so you would need to have the spectral layers uh, licensed and activated. So when you go to your audio menu, you're not gonna see the extensions until you've purchased one. So if you have spectral layers, if you have Melodyne, uh, so just because you have 10.512 doesn't mean that it's going to turn on other licenses. So make sure that you've purchased the uh, spectral layers and then, um, you know, then you should see it automatically show up. Okay, so let's see, question, uh, I got a singer track to record my voice along. I create an audio track uh, below that to record. Is that possible to have the reference track 10 dB softer uh, whenever I record? You know, the best thing to do is just to, you know, if you have uh, an audio track here, so let's just go to uh, an audio track. Um, and let's say if we duplicate that, so if you always want that to be 10 dB softer, and this is where you could do a link between these two tracks. So let's come here, let's say this is at zero, I'll just type in minus 10. And now we will choose to link these two tracks. So as soon as I link them, then there will always be, uh, let's, sorry, just set this. So I will select this track, this track, and now link. And we'll link the volumes between those two. So now whenever those will always be 10 dB difference in volume. So. But uh, and you could have that set up within your template if you wanted to. Okay, so I see... Uh, 
All right, so we had some questions that were sent in advance. Let's go ahead through some of those. So seeing uh, Michael is asking, or Mikhail was asking for one that he had submitted in advance. So let me go ahead and go through some of these. And again, if you want to submit questions in advance, you could send it to uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. Okay. Okay, so let's come back over here. Um, okay, it says, I made a live recording of my band, an hour and 20 minutes long. Uh, I would like to separate each song into its own song folder. What is the best way to do that without having each file big, so big? Okay, so this gets to be problematic with a lot of different scenarios. So let's say if we have a live recording. So we've done a live recording. Let's say these are different pieces here. So what we could do is, you know, select the in and out points with the range tool. Say this is song one. Uh, let's add a marker. So add a marker track. And what I've done here is I've set kind of like, this is song one and on the marker track, we can see we want to add a cycle marker. So I've added cycle markers for songs one, two, and three, let's say, but it could be 15 songs, could be 20 songs, um, doesn't matter. Okay, so basically we have our contiguous live long form recording here. And then we're going to have our everything laid out for us and broken apart by cycle markers. At this point, we could go to export audio mix down and I'm going to select all of my audio channels. And what I want to have is we're going to give it a file. We could give it a file name if we want. Um, I'm going to say, let's choose a file path. I'm going to put it onto my desktop. And we'll call it June 9th. Okay, so we have that done. And what I want to do is we'll see the export range. So we're going to say export this particular song and I gave the marker, the cycle marker a name and you could do that just by coming over here. Sorry, my son's going a little crazy. Uh, you may hear him in the background having too much fun with the piano. So when we go over here, you could just click on the marker track and click on the edit and you could in the description type in the marker name. As we go to the marker name, we go to our export audio mix down. So we can think of each song having its own cycle marker. We're going to give it a name. Now there's also this little candy thing called a naming scheme. So here I want to apply the channel name. So I have like piano and uh, upright bass. Um, so I want to include the channel name and the cycle marker name, which is gonna be the name of the piece. So I will come here and again, we're gonna do a export audio and then we could have it automatically choose to create a new project. And you, we would kind of set that up. So now I just say export audio. It's gonna go through. And now here's our new project where everything has just been broken down into the individual files that we've, that we've laid out for us here. Now when we go into our pool window and we'll just see exactly where these files are. We'll just go to the pool window and we'll click on file. We go to our path. We can see that they'll be going to our desktop to uh, to the folder that we've specified. And it's actually named the files, uh, you know, the name of the audio, audio track itself, plus the name of the song, which is extracted from 
the cycle marker. So again, just come over here, set up cycle markers for each song. And then just when you do your export audio mix down, at that point, you want to, we'll just activate this, choose which particular files that you want it to be exported. So let's say you wanted all these files, choose an independent folder, give it a naming scheme that makes sense. So give it the cycle marker, the name of the song, the date, the name of the you know artist, whatever you want it to. Uh, and then for each folder, just do a separate cycle marker and that will move just only those particular files over to the new project for you. Okay. Um, so it says, I've noticed I can render drums and groove agent without having to dissolve MIDI data and my tracks will be split to each individual channel. However, the issue is out of five drum elements, as an example, two will be missing. Any reason why it's like that? So let's go ahead and take a listen. So we have, let's say I have two different groove agent examples here. So let's say. So come here and let's say I'll open this up and I have these going to individual outputs. So I have my kick, snare, hi-hat, and these are going to individual outs directly inside a groove agent. So when I have this done as a beat agent, we could set the individual outs here. And then when I go to render in place under edit, I could just choose to, uh, I'll go to my render settings. Uh, we'll set this up um, and we'll do it as one event. I'll just choose to render. And now each of those will automatically be rendered to their own individual tracks. So I'll have my kick. Snare, hi-hat, room, overheads and room. And if I wanted to do this for like a beat agent, let's say something like this, where we want to do, and the mixer would be slightly different where you could take each of these and run it to multiple outputs. Um, so if it's on a beat agent, we could kind of do the same exact concept. So just go to edit to render in place and we'll do render settings. And again, so that's kind of including all the different examples here. So the crash, hi-hat, and our kick. So those are all kind of uh, rendering and it's not dropping any particular channels for me. So maybe if you could send a link to a project, I'd be happy to kind of take a look to see if you have any routing that's maybe causing that particular problem. Okay, so I see question, is it possible to assign MIDI CC or key commands to select quick control layer page in a right zone VSTI tab? I haven't found a way. So if you're come over here, let's say to retro log and we'll go up here. When you get into like different remote control editors, sometimes you could have pages and pages of parameters and you could select between different quick control parameters by clicking on this page. I haven't found a way to do this with a keyboard shortcut um, or a, a key command or a way. I saw some discussions of people that were using almost like a screen reader software, which is kind of what blind people use or visually impaired people use that can come over here and move a mouse to a very specific range and click a mouse. But I don't know of a way to have that automatically be automated to page to cycle through the pages, but I'll pass that on as kind of a feature request. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so I have a question on configuration. I can't figure out how to work. I have an Arturia 
Mark II 61 key MIDI controller. I've got the DAW with uh, Mix MCU working with the Mackie MCU config in Cubase Pro 10.5. So that works fine with transport controls and faders, pan, etc. cetera. Uh, now the problem is to get the track quick controls and VST instrument quick controls working. I've tried a lot of a lot reading forms using quick learn, etc. I also try to configure it uh, in the studio configurations. Uh, my understanding is MCU controls uh, communicating using a different protocol for MCU than MIDI does and MIDI for track and VST quick control should work. Still MCU is configured. I do see MIDI meter when turning faders and knobs and trying to get to these, but no luck. Uh, any tip on how to fix these and get them configured? It would be practical to use quick controls and VST controls for the instruments. Thanks for any input or help as to how to solve this or where to troubleshoot on MIDI in and out on this. Some controllers, and I'm not that familiar, I've you know, played around with the Arturia controller. Uh, I know some controllers can have different control ports uh so when we go to your studio setup that some controllers can have different ports for um transport control versus what's being transmitted for midi so sometimes you know so if your arturia has that try to set you know it you know that would be the way to set it up to one port is using Mackie control and the other one is using is spitting out MIDI data. Um, so if it doesn't have that, you may just have to disable because you know you could have it set for Mackie control and that's great for transport. But um, I I'm very used to transport functions just from the computer keyboard, so I tend not to use my controller for that just because it's very muscle memory ingrained for me. And a lot of my transport's also done on a CC-121. Um, so if you're doing a lot of virtual instruments, you may be able to, if it's not sent down separate MIDI ports, you may have to physically just turn off, you know, if there's a software mode to disable Mackie control where it's just going to spit out MIDI, then you could just have your VST quick controls and that's going to take any MIDI data. So I know some people may use faders for some of these parameters for like an MCU and then may use the knobs for, you know, not for MC, not for Mackie control functions, but for MIDI stuff for tweaking parameters on instruments. So if you have a way of separating the device, will, you know, internally from one port being Mackie control or the other one not, or certain parameters. Because once a parameter is kind of defined, it could be many controllers will kind of move all that data to one particular port uh, and will kind of blockade it and you can't really move it out. So it could be a little bit of a pain, but I think also if you got it set up for MIDI controllers, you know, like the benefit of having control of your VST instruments over transport, which could be done so easily using your computer keyboard, that may outweigh the benefit for it. Uh, so questions, and it's kind of going back to the same thing, are dark controllers use Mackie control protocol supported by the remote control editor? So you may not, I believe it's going to function directly in here. So if you're not familiar, you can go to a particular plugin and go to the remote control editor. And then I think if you just kind of use standard layout here, um, that you could have kind of like the eight different parameters for your Mackie control. And this could also allow you to work with like, you know, different Yukon control services and Yamaha Nuage. But I believe that the, that will be the same ones that will work for your Mackie control as well. Okay, so it says, uh, hi, Greg, Cubaser since 1994, uh, recently upgraded to 10.5. Excellent program. Thank you for these hangs hangouts. They're a godsend. You're welcome. Glad they're helpful. Uh, questions. One, some older projects load VST instruments, which I no longer use or need, like Groove Agent 3, but I can't seem to delete them. How do I get rid of these unwanted instruments? So if you have an instrument that's like referenced within a project, so let's say um, 
Let's see if I could recreate it. So let's say you have like a groove agent. Let's see, I may have like an old, let me just stack my VST plugin manager here real quick. Um, so I think if it'll kind of show up, if you're, if it's referencing a plugin from a project that's not showing up anymore, you could, you know, you'll probably see it kind of listed here with like maybe an indication that it can't find that plugin, maybe like an exclamation point here. Try just to set that to not connected. And if you have a particular MIDI track that's referencing, to that connection, to that that missing plugin, try sending that to you know to not connect it as well, or to another destination, and then try to save the project and see if that will make a difference. I think once the, that doesn't see that track or that uh, plugin being you know, trying to load for the project, uh, if it's not trying to do that, then I don't think it will actually kind of try to recall that. Okay, some projects load HSSE, but I really don't want to use that, so delete it to say processor and loading time. How do I remove it from a project? I, I just wonder if your project is, um, if I wonder if the project is being saved, if you have that saved as a MIDI file, um, because generally the projects won't load up HSSE, the Hellion Sonic SE edition, but if it's a MIDI file by default, it'll do that. And then you could change that behavior by going into preferences and under MIDI to MIDI, MIDI file, um, destination you could just choose midi tracks as opposed to Hallion sonic se multi-timbral so usually the only time that that imports is when and that does that is if it's opening up a midi file so if you change that one preference under midi files i think you'll be all set okay question i try to create a template by loading a single instance of Hallion 6 with multiple programs which i created as my default then created multiple midi tracks to trigger the different programs uh, however cubase converted the midi tracks to instrument tracks and then loaded a separate instance of my Hallion 6 default group for each track to solve this i created a separate Hallion instrument tracks with only one program instrument per instance isn't it more wasteful to have multiple instances of Hallion as opposed to one? Sorry for a long question. So I wonder if this is maybe related to the MIDI files again. And it's not more wasteful, especially um, if you're using multi, if you have, you know, because different instances can spread across multiple processor cores better. So I don't think it's going to be uh, less... Uh, so I don't think it's going to be less efficient in that way. Okay, next question. Uh, in order to create custom Hallion instruments, I have one project where I sample the audio drums, etc. Then after editing, I drag uh, audio into Hallion, a Groove Agent 5 SE, and create and save my instruments. If I delete the audio files from the project, will my instruments lose connection to the audio? Will save a sample solve this? And will my other projects which use these instruments know where to find the program? All right, so let's say if we have um, samples here. So I've recorded like a kick and a snare and I have an instance, a groove agent. So, and I drag, let's say this kick over to there and I drag my snare. Uh, at this point, if I come over here and say export kit with samples, I will choose to put it onto my desktop So we'll just call it GA5, June 9th. 
Um, and then you could give it a name, whatever you want. Okay. And then when you hit, okay. So within Halion or Groove Agent, if I come over here, uh, and I hit, okay, now, um, that will, and we could choose exactly, let's just put it. Okay, so, and then at this point, if I deleted those particular files off my hard drive, that will now copy, um, let me just go to my finder and we'll look at my desktop. So here's our folder, here's our preset, list it right here, and our folder, which will have the samples included. So if you deleted the samples, directly from your Cubase project, as long as you exported the kit with the samples, uh, you'll be all set. So again, just right click and choose to export kit with samples and then you could delete it from your project without it worrying. You know, samples are gonna be copied and moved to whatever folder you define. Okay, then question, um, I cannot get control room to work. If I want to audition samples in the media bay, I have to disable it. Also in VST Connect Pro does not work for me at all. Can you help please? So I haven't really come across, you know, make sure that you have, when you go to audition different samples here in the media bay. So let's say, You know, that, that pretty much, I've kind of always seen that work for people without any issues. Um, so make sure, cause it, it may go out to like the first uh, speaker. So check your audio connections and make sure like in your control room that it's gonna be routed to your top speaker if that's your active monitor. So if it's maybe not the first monitor, maybe it's being routed to your first monitor instead. Um, so that's something to check. Um, you know, VST Connect Pro, so if you purchase that, you know, it's checked to make sure that you had the latest version. About a month ago, they did a pretty significant update to that. Um, so if you've had problems in the past with that, really kind of check out uh, what's, you know, the latest version and try to use a wired connection whenever you can. Okay, next question. I have uh, multiple USB audio cards, a Roland MC707, a Steinberg UR22, a Motu M4, an Access Virus T1 connected, but I can only have one USB audio interface activated at a time. How can I use the inputs and outputs simultaneously in Cubase 10? If you're on a Mac, you could use, uh, you could set up in core audio an aggregate audio device um, that will compound the latency. So it may not be so practical when you're running like, you know, 40 milliseconds of latency for all the different audio interfaces. Uh, on Windows, if you need to do it, you know, and the reason why we generally shy away from doing this is as you're dealing with audio, you know, you figure out that you're going to have a clock, you know, like with the UR22, you have a clock that's, you know, needs to be in sync 192,000 times a second. So if there's no way for the clocks of the different audio interfaces to resolve, you know, it becomes unpredictable and unreliable. Some people on the Windows platform will use ASIO for all, but I think most people, and then you could select different audio interfaces. It's not the best solution. I think everyone that's tried it for any serious work has found it to be frustrating and not work well. So, you know, ideally you'd want to have one interface with all the inputs and outputs that you need. But if you really needed it in a pinch on Windows, try ASIO for all or try aggregate, creating an aggregate device on your Mac. Okay, so question, imagine effects bus with a reverb plugin. When I use Cubase EQ, how to know if EQ is before or after the reverb plugin? So when we look at our channel strip for a device, um, you know, we could think of the signal flow as being left to right. So we're gonna have our inserts that come before our channel strip. Um, now, if we want the channel strip signal flow to come before, we could just click 
on this little icon here and switch to signal flow. Uh, we have our channel strip here and we could have our signal flow indicated here. And again, we could switch the signal flow of that. And the channel strip is going to include the channel EQ. So the signal flow, think of it as going from left to right. So the EQs will come before the sends. Okay. Question, is there a way for the acoustic agent player section to follow a MIDI groove quantized preset? I uh, hope the question makes sense. So when, if we have the acoustic agent player, let me just look at a particular part here. I'll just enable this track. Okay, so if we have the pattern laid out for us, So it's not going to be able to follow the timing pattern of, you know, a particular, like as it's playing in real time. So if it's, when it's playing in real time, the pattern will be, will be played back as is directly here. If we drag that pattern into the project window, we could take another pattern. Let's say if I want to take this pattern here, and let me enable this track quickly. So if I like this particular pattern, what you could do, let's say from a bass part, if they're both kind of aligned into the file, we could come over here and drag this pattern into like that groove into that part. And then I could choose to take the other part and quantize based on those particular settings, but it's not going to take like the input timing of a bass in real time, alter the pattern here. They would have to have both patterns on a project window for that to kind of have an effect. Okay, it says, hi, I'm on Cubase 10. When looking through loops in Media Bay for inspiration, is it possible to search for loops using time signature like 3-4, et cetera? So when we want to look at our different criteria for searching, so, you know, we could come over here and say, okay, I'm looking for, you know, drum beats. And let's say I'm looking for drum beats that are in four, or in, you know, by meter. So if we click here at the top, we could have these different criteria. So one of them would be under musical, and I think we could see our key signature here. So at this point, um, we could say I'm looking for drum beats. So let's say I'm looking for beats that will be and and again we'll come over here. I may not have a lot of three four drum loops, but um, based on signature, and then you could see all your different signatures here. So there's three four drum loops. There's four two eight four. Here's patterns are in six eight etc. So you could then search by different time signatures if you want. Okay, so it says, I uh, would love to see how to warp a track uh, into BPM for my project. Let's say my project's at 180 BPM. I wanna use a part from 130 BPM song. I try a lot, but it would not change the pitch of 130 track. So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so let's say I have these two different files. And as we play. So let's say those aren't being aligned to the particular file. So if you know what the tempo is, so let's say we have Nostalgia and Tinkle as the name of the file. So we'll go into our pool window. 
And then we'll see uh, that they're going to have the tempo. So if you know what the tempo is, you know, and you, there's different ways of, as we showed before. So these will be two different tempos. So what I want to do is to select both of these files and place them into musical mode. And I could do that directly from my media menu here uh, within the pool. I could enable musical mode here or just turn it on for both events. And now whatever tempo I have for the project, they'll just automatically play in sync. So if I wanted to slow down my tempo to 88 beats a minute, So it'll be kind of like a tempo parasite, if you will. Now, uh, we had another question about, uh, can show me how to assign automation to the right MIDI channel in Halion instead of MIDI channels, the main channel. So I think uh, it came in via Facebook before we did the Hangout. Um, so let's say if we have a Halion instrument here, Can now let's say we want to just kind of play this. And they wanted to be able to kind of as a write a parameter to have that parameter automatically visible in the automation lanes. So let's show how to do that. And there's a little setting we could do in the automation panel. Sorry, if you hit F6 and go to settings and you could choose to reveal parameter on right. So now as soon as I come here, I click on R and W in the plugin. And as soon as I move this, then that parameter shows up automatically, <coughs> excuse me, shows up automatically underneath the file. So now we can just kind of draw in different changes. So if I want to take this and just kind of draw in a filter change. And then if I wanted to select just that range of automation and just have that repeated a number of times, I can just hit control D. And then as we kind of do that, So that's some of the easy ways to do that. All right, so let's move back. We'll do a couple more questions and we'll try to wrap up in just a little bit. Okay. Okay, so question, how do you record over only a part of a track and replace a section of the track with a new recording? Okay, so let's say I'm on this particular track here. Um, let's, let's do this one here. Okay, so as I want to record over a particular track here, let's, let's say, I'll just take this and then just hit record. And you can see that that file will just be recorded directly over top of the original file. And if you wanted to like get rid of that file, you could just kind of come over here. And I think if we just go to uh, under editing, there's going to be, you know, you could have it uh, maybe under your Cubase preferences to editing to delete overlaps. And then as you do that, um, you could have that event automatically delete the events underneath. But just as you record on top, it'll just kind of, kind of uh, hide, it'll just kind of replace directly over the existing part for you. All 
Okay, so question, anyone know how to activate the audio to play out of my PC? So, you know, what you wanna do is make sure that's going out of the correct audio interface. Um, so if you wanna use the audio out of your PC, make sure that you go to your studio setup. Uh, and if it's on PC, you may see this listed as a generic low latency ASIO driver. So select that and click on a control panel and then you should be able to see different options whether it's being sent to your headphone out, your line out, or maybe an HDMI output. And that way you could send it to different destinations. Okay, so just saying Ed saying he'll send a video of his uh, issue, so. That'd be great to see. Okay, let's just go ahead. Okay, so uh, I see a question from Robbie. I have a simple question. I have hundreds of wave drum samples. Is there a program I can use to create in, you know, just drag them into a uh, groove agent. Um, so anytime that you have any audio files, you know, just come over here, go to groove agent. My son has a, is having too much fun today. Um, but once you have instruments, you know, just, you know, just come directly to Groove Agent and just, you know, drag the files right into instrument pads and save them. Uh, yeah, Groove Agent's a, a great way to do that. So. Okay, so um, yeah, seeing someone else mentioning they should do that, Robbie should just do it in Groove Agent. So it's a great way to organize all your different samples. Okay, so it says Hi, Greg, having a problem with quick controls when reactivating an instrument track. The parameter to be controlled is there, but the value reflected play says NA or is blank and controller has no effect. Um, so make sure that you have, you know, make sure that you have, you know, because quick controls can be done kind of two different ways. Um, so when I, when you come over here, you could have like your VST quick controls, make sure that these are set, uh, and then you can have track quick controls, which could be independent. So make sure that you have both. Sometimes people get these, uh, both confused with each other, but I have them kind of set up for the same, uh, eight faders on mine. But if you have like a screenshot that you could send, uh, you can send to Patrick to club Cubase at Steinberg.de. That would be great. Okay, so uh, see a question. Is Beat Designer still included with Cubase Pro 10.5? Yep, so as soon as we go to a plugin, we go to a MIDI or an instrument track, you could go to your MIDI inserts, and then at that point, you could just see your Beat Designer, uh, and then you could just have fun and make all sorts of great beats and a lot of beats to work with directly in there. Okay, how about providing discounts for updates users since six and feel I shouldn't be charged as much as those who only own there since eight, for instance, I need to update from 9.5 at $159 warning. Um, so there's usually different promotions going on. So look, you know, I think there's usually kind of a summer sale. 
So you could, you know, keep your eyes open for that. But, you know, like every month there's different promotions that'll be going on for our Cubase users. So, and Nuendo users and, you know, different Dorico users as well. So, Okay, so see question in Cubase. I'm trying to get a single key for my foot pedal to start recording and stop recording as well as the project cursor. Is it possible that is? I'd like to have stop and record key as toggles. So, you know, if you want to, again, just do it as a generic remote. Go to your studio menu to studio setup. Sorry for kids screaming outside my office if you hear it. So we'll set our correct input here I will do a MIDI learn so let me go ahead and just delete some of my generic remotes I've had set up here so my son's having too much fun outside all right so let's come over here I think so I've just hit a sustain pedal, and now what I want to do is to have this transport. Let's go to device, and I'll just say, let's, So let's just say I'll have this set to start, uh, and then you could just have this be toggle if you wanted to. And now you could just simply have that. So, you know, play around with the generic remote. Um, so and then that should be able to kind of do that directly for you. So if you want to do stop, fast forward, rewind, record. So yeah, and you could use, you know, actual MIDI notes on your controller keyboard as well. So. Okay, so um, it says I want to export Groove Agent multitracks. I use the add kit and effects to mixer, but when I render the tracks, it seems to render the room mics and overhead mics for each part of the kit separately. So let's give it a try real quick. I'll revert this quickly. Thanks for all the great questions. I hope everyone's learned a trick or two. Okay, so I'll take this and let's go to our Groove Agent. Sorry, I'll select the right track this time. And we're gonna take all the settings from the mixer and groove agent here and export it uh, to Cubase. Okay, so now I play it. Okay, so let's say I have these going on. So 
So let's turn up the room. All right, let me just check my render place settings again here. So let me just try with the channel settings. And I'll just try with complete signal path and see what it does here. So that seemed like it worked and um, so it didn't seem like it was doing the mics and overhead mics separately when I did that. So, uh, but if you want to send me a link to a project, that'd be helpful. So question, do buffer settings matter when using render in place? It's not as critical because it's not actually processing in real time, it's doing it offline. So the buffer settings aren't as critical at that stage. Um, is it possible to increment decrement track volume, say by 10 dB in an inspector using key command or logical editor preset? Um, it's what you could do is, um, you know, if you have automation, So let me just see if if I have this automation selected here um, and we go to project logical editor. We can say our media type is equal to automation and we want to trim and we'll say multiply by, and it's not necessarily a dB value, but let's say 0 0.9. So let's see if it doesn't have the automation, if that will knock it down. No, but if we have, let's say automation values there, then you could kind of set it up so if you have automation points, and again there and here, you could say media type is equal to automation trim, and then you could set up different values, let's say 0 0.95. And then you could just kind of come over here and drop automation that way. But it won't do it necessarily on the fader position, but it will if there's automation. Okay, Greg, hello from Russia. Uh, greetings, thanks. Um, always wanted to go there. Um, do you know a way to add author name in Cubase when I say VSTI presets, for example, from Pad Shop? There's a line to choose an author. However, I can't add my name at all. All right, so let's take a look. All right, so say I'll do something. All right, so let's say I wanted to save this as my own preset. Um, So let me do this, let's come over here, save preset. Um, you'll see like this little 
attribute inspector. So we'll give it a name. Okay, so I'm going to save that there. Let's come over to maybe Media Bay. Let's take a look if we could do it in Media Bay. Okay, so here's my June 9th pad shop preset that I've made. Um, so once we have this, we could go to kind of like your settings here. And let's go to the attribute inspector. Um, then at this point, you could think if we want to add different parameters, you could say text and you want it to be display name of author. Then I think you might be able to add it It just looks so You know, probably in here somewhere you could have, you know, like the library name, library creator. So oh, I think under staff, maybe author. So let's come here. Let's go back to dynamics. So, and then right under here, under author, you could just kind of enter your name in there. So try experimenting with the, uh, the metadata uh, in, inside of the uh, media bay. All right, we'll see if we get one more question. Maybe we'll wrap up. Uh, so I see a question. Can you tell me if Cubase includes a plugin similar to EasyBase? Um, I don't think it's similar, but one of the probably the best sounding base plugin that I've seen available is going to be one that ships inside of Halion or one that's sold separately, rather. Sorry. Um, and it's called the Steinberg Electric Base. Um, so I think this is probably the most detailed electric base sample it's ever been done. So uh, it doesn't like automatically play styles and I find all that, you know, not to be too useful, but this is uh, a fantastic instrument there. And we'll end on... Um, Linear tracks versus musical tracks uh, and projects with video. So let's do this and then we'll wrap up after that. I'm going to have to go hang out with my son. He's been very patient. So let's go ahead and open this up.
Okay, so let's say um, I want it to have my video feed here. So let's say like right at that point, I want it like a symbol. So let me just go ahead and find like a quick orchestral percussion. Just find a So do something incredibly cheesy like this. All right, so now I want this to come in as we're playing this. All right, so I will go ahead and let's just say I wanted that particular sound to come in right where that event started. So I could place this into musical mode, into edit mode. So I say like, use video follows edit mode here. I could just place this. Let me just see if I could find. Okay, so now when I place this. Okay, so let's say I come here right where that cloud comes in. Okay, so if this is in linear mode, and this particular track is in linear mode, when I change my tempo, that event is gonna fall at the same time. So we'll come here and as we go to the, all right, but if, if I had that event in musical mode, as I adjust the tempo here, that event will just kind of play back at a different time entirely. So when we have an event set to linear mode, that event will be locked to that, that particular value in time. So regardless of what tempo changes, that's gonna start right where those clouds come in. And that's really kind of the intention of linear versus musical mode uh, on events. Okay. Okay, with that, we've gone about uh, three hours and 51 minutes. Uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank everyone for wonderful questions today. I hope that everyone has uh, learned a tip or trick. Um, we'll be doing another Hangout this Friday, so at the same time. So if you have questions, uh, you could send them to me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. It's uh, it's always a thrill being able to interact with people throughout the world uh, in these Hangouts, and I hope that they're helpful while a bunch of people are staying home uh, with different health situations. And so but we want everyone to please stay safe and healthy and continue to make some great music with your Cubase. Um, and if you have any questions you want to send in advance, you could send them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. And we'll go ahead and wrap up and we will see you on Friday. Thank you very much. Have a great week and we'll see you on Friday. Take care.